Hello everybody and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today's creation myth, encode disproved junk DNA. Before we get into the specifics of the creationist claim here, we need a bit of background, like what in the world is ENCODE? Well, ENCODE refers to the ENCODE project, which stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. This was a follow-on, I should say is a follow-on, to the Human Genome Project, and it's an effort to identify all of the functional elements present in the human genome. Basically, what's there and what does all of it do? And ENCODE started publishing papers, I think around 2007, and they made a bit of a splash because they found widespread activity and they presented this as evidence for widespread functionality within the human genome, which was contrary to the consensus at the time. Now, the creationist argument around ENCODE and junk DNA is a bit of a bank shot. It goes like this. Evolution cannot maintain a high functional fraction, meaning evolution Processes like natural selection cannot maintain a large genome that is mostly functional. In other words, evolution requires junk DNA. The ENCODE project shows that the human genome is mostly functional. It has a high functional fraction and little, if any, junk DNA. Therefore, evolution is wrong. That's the way this argument is framed for creationists. I will say there's a secondary argument here. It's that in a designed genome, you would expect a high functional fraction. So creationists will say that ENCODE fulfills a uh, prediction of uh, the special creation model. And I have two problems with that. One is that I can't find anything, uh, and I could be wrong about this, but to my knowledge, this is not something that creationists were saying before ENCODE was, was published. This is something they kind of latched onto once ENCODE started promoting this idea that there was very little, if any, junk DNA in the human genome. The second problem with this is it is in direct contradiction to ideas like John Sanford's genetic entropy. If the genome is degenerating, then we shouldn't find a lot of uh, functional stuff in there. We should find a lot of broken down stuff that's not doing anything. Uh, and in, in particular, if you go by the rate of degeneration that Sanford proposes, and I forget the number off the top of my head, and then use the apply that rate of degeneration to the young earth timeline, the human genome would be mostly degenerated by now, and we should start seeing the fitness effects of that, which is in direct contradiction with a mostly functional human genome. So there's that secondary argument about how this is a prediction of the creation model. I'm going to put that aside. I don't think that's valid uh, in terms of actually being a prediction of the uh, creations promoting the creation model. Now, one place where you see this argument, or at least creationists will claim you see this argument, is from a biologist named Dan Crower, who is a very prominent anti-creationist and also a very prominent uh, critic of the ENCODE project. In 2013, at a conference, he said that if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. Now, creationists love to lift this quote out of context to say that Crower acknowledges that if the ENCODE findings are correct, then the theory of evolution is wrong. That's not what Grauer was saying, and I'm going to leave it to other people to explain this because it's beyond the scope of this video and I don't want to make it very long, but basically Grauer was saying that if ENCODE is right, we need to rethink a bunch of what we know about how evolution works. He was not saying that evolutionary theory would be false. But in the grand scheme of things, that is neither here nor there, so let us move on to the next point. The sources creationists use come from ENCODE itself, and the most well-known publication from ENCODE is its main 2012 paper, An Integrated Encyclopedia of DNA Elements in the Human Genome. This is the paper that made a big splash with some really provocative findings. So in this paper, they published results showing that 62% of the human genome is transcribed, that 56.1% is enriched for histone modification, and 80.4% of the genome has some biochemical activity, transcription, methylation, protein binding, some kind of activity. This is a direct quote from the paper. These data enable us to assign biochemical functions for 80% of the genome. And that's the line right there that creationists love to latch onto and say the human genome is mostly functional, therefore evolution is wrong. There are a bunch of other sources that creationists like in addition to that paper. Uh, but these tend to be things like interviews and press releases that don't carry much weight in terms of the, the scientific value. 
These other sources tend to be hyperbolic, and they also often conflict with the actual papers put out by the ENCODE project. So for example, we have a what was in effect a press release uh, called ENCODE Project, writes eulogy for junk DNA, that was released just uh, a few weeks, maybe a month, I think, before uh, that 2012 paper. And then also, right around that time, a little bit before that 2012 paper was released, uh, you and Bernie, uh, who's an ENCODE member and an author on their papers, uh, in an interview said that about 80% of the genome is actually transcribed. And again, this was just a little bit, maybe a couple months before that paper I just talked about was released. And in there, they found 62% of the genome was transcribed. So you've got a member of the ENCODE project who's an author on the paper misstating the contents of the actual paper. So obviously, uh, this is going to lead to a little bit of confusion in terms of what the ENCODE findings actually are. So now let's talk about why this creationist argument is wrong. The first thing, and I want to dispense with this pretty quickly, is that a high functional fraction is perfectly compatible with evolution. You can have a large, complex genome. It's mostly functional. That's not a problem for evolution to deal with. And there's a paper on this, Mutational Load and the Functional Fraction of the Human Genome, that was published just earlier this year. In this paper, the authors write, we find that the functional fraction is not very likely to be limited substantially by mutational load, and that any such limit, if it exists, depends strongly on the selection coefficients of new deleterious mutations. In other words, the genome can tolerate a lot of mutations. If any of them are really bad, they'll be selected out. That's what these authors are saying to say, basically, you can have a lot of function, and it's fine. So the takeaway from this study is that even if you take the creationist characterization of ENCODE as fact, the anti-evolution argument, the therefore evolution is wrong, that argument fails. But let's see if we can take the characterization of ENCODE as fact. Spoiler alert, we cannot. So the next thing I want to make clear is that junk DNA exists. And this is not me saying this, this is not other authors saying this, junk DNA exists according to ENCODE. Even that 2012 paper, as provocative as it was, even that paper shows that junk DNA exists. In that paper, the ENCODE team used the broadest possible definition for function. They basically took anything that had any biochemical activity and said, that's functional. Now in that paper, they found biochemical activity for 80.4% of the genome, meaning about 20% of the genome had no activity. So according to ENCODE's own standards, right off the bat, you've got 20% of the genome that's non-functional. It's 20% junk. But wait, there's more. Much of the documented activity that they found is actually indicative of non-functional regions of the genome. You just have to read between the lines a little bit and pass the press releases. So for example, when they're talking about transcription, that 62% of the genome that's transcribed, they write, most transcribed bases are within or overlapping annotated gene boundaries, that is, intronic. And only 31% of bases in sequence transcripts were intergenic. What that statement says in a bit of biology jargon is that of that 62% of the genome that they said is transcribed according to that 2012 paper, about two-thirds of it is exons and introns. And we know that exons are only about 1.5% of the genome, so a huge fraction of what is transcribed, nearly two-thirds of the documented transcription that they found, was actually introns. Now we know that introns, they're not protein coding, they're transcribed and then they're cut out of the RNA before translation occurs. We know that parts of the introns are functional and can serve. They're the markers on the ends of the introns that basically say, cut here. But the long regions in between those cut here marks, those are a mess. They're full of things like transposons and non-conserved, essentially random sequences. They're not functional. So right here, we have the ENCODE project saying, if you read the full paper and read beyond the press releases, that most of the, the transcriptional activity they described is not associated with a documented function. It gets even better because ENCODE continued to work on their data sets and they published an update in 2014, defining functional DNA elements in the human genome. And I do want to point out, look who's an author on this paper, you and Bernie, right there, the same guy who a couple years earlier erroneously said that 80% of the genome was transcribed. So now they uh, were a little more specific here in terms of what was and was not likely to be functional despite having biochemical activity. And one of the figures in this paper was this uh, set of circles that I'm showing right here. 
So in this, they broke down the genome by biochemical activity level, basically high, medium, or low levels of activity. Those are the three blue circles here. They also showed with the green shading, that's the fraction of the genome for which there is genetic evidence of function. In other words, is it associated with a phenotype? And then you have this little purple circle, that's the protein coding. We know that's not very much, that only works out to about 1.5% of the genome. And then in red, we have evolutionary evidence, that's conservation. For mammals, that works out to about 5% of the genome is conserved across all mammals. So in this 2014 publication, ENCODE was much more uh, nuanced in their presentation of the different lines of evidence for function in different parts of the genome. And they're very clear that much of the activity that they describe is actually not strong evidence for a selected function in that region of the genome. So let's look at some of the ways in code documented widespread non-functional DNA with biochemical activity. And I apologize, I'm going to quote at length from that paper a little bit, but it's important to show exactly what language and code is using and what it means. Specifically for transcribed regions, the authors write, at present, we cannot distinguish which low abundance transcripts are functional, especially for RNAs that lack the defining characteristics of known protein coding, structural, or regulatory RNAs. A priori, we should not expect the transcriptome to consist exclusively of functional RNAs. Zero tolerance for errant transcripts would come at a high cost in the proofreading machinery needed to perfectly gate RNA polymerase and splicing activities or to instantly eliminate spurious transcripts. In general, sequences encoding RNAs transcribed by noisy transcriptional machinery are expected to be less constrained, which is consistent with data shown here for very low abundance RNA. In other words, transcribed does not mean functional. Be transcribed and non-functional, and they describe here how you can tell the difference. If something is transcribed at low levels, if it's something that's transcribed but not well conserved, that implies that those transcripts are spurious rather than functional. That paragraph actually leads into a more general discussion of how ENCODE approaches this question of how to evaluate functionality. They write, regions with higher signals generally exhibit higher levels of evolutionary conservation. Thus, one should have high confidence that the subset of the genome with large signals for RNA or chromatin signatures coupled with strong conservation is functional and will be supported by appropriate genetic tests. In contrast, the larger proportion of genome with reproducible but low biochemical signal strength and less evolutionary conservation is challenging to parse between specific functions and biological noise. They're describing parameters here to evaluate is something functional or not. In English, if you have low biochemical activity, some activity but a low level of it, and that region is not evolutionarily conserved, then it's probably not functional. And as we'll see in a minute, that describes an extremely large portion of the activity that ENCODE documented. This is another figure from the same paper, and it is a summary of the overall ENCODE data. So let's look at what we have here. Now, this is a complex figure, so follow me as we go through it. I'm gonna work through it little bit by little bit, but there's a lot going on here, so don't worry about what I don't mention, just follow me and we'll make it nice and clear. So first, on the y-axis, we have percent of the genome, from 0 to 100%. And then the x-axis is broken up into different classes of activity. So you've got transcribed, protein binding, and then histone marks refers to histone modifications, things like you're adding things to histones that are going to change the chromatin structure of the DNA. So the first thing I want to point out is in this transcribed part of the graph right here, the scale, FPKM, you don't need to know what that means. It doesn't matter. Just know that until you get to at least 0.5, you're looking at less than one transcript per cell, meaning less than one copy of a given piece of RNA per cell. And below that level, it's not doing anything. So anything below 0.5, you can write that off as spurious. Now, ignore these two columns because that's just breaking out into specific things. Just look at all transcription in this third column. Here we have anything at all and 0.1 as the threshold for that detection, you could write those two things off. That's definitely not functional. And then if you read this paper to see what the cutoffs are, depending on the cell type, it's gonna range from 0.5 to 5, which is this kind of nice, nice uh, deep green emerald region down here. So the actual 
frequency of the genome, the actual percent of the genome that is going to be involved with transcription in a functional way is somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, give or take, or maybe up into the neighborhood of 37, 38 percent. That's what these data show. Now, I'm not going to worry about this protein binding part because that's all fairly low level, so don't worry about it. We come over here, we have a bunch of other high level activities. Uh, this is looking at uh, modification uh, associated with transcription and repression. Now, the thing I want to point out here is that these values are a little trickier to parse. You got to read the text of the paper, and these values are the negative log of the p value for, the, for those regions. Basically, how significant is the activity in those regions? So if you do the math for that, the value here, the value for these numbers that's statistically significant is somewhere in the neighborhood, is somewhere between one and two. So if your uh, threshold is one right here, you could just forget all those. They're gonna be below that, that threshold for significance, okay? So you can get rid of uh, all these white bars. And as you can see, that's going to decrease the functional fraction significantly for these regions. So again, this is ENCODE's own data, and if you read how they interpret it in the paper, their own data is indicative of a very high percentage of non-functionality in the genome. In other words, there's a lot of junk DNA in the human genome according to ENCODE's data and their interpretation. So the takeaway from ENCODE is that a high percentage of the human genome exhibits biochemical activity, like 80-ish percent, but very little of the genome has a well-documented function is something we've, we've tested and we know exactly what it does. And that's around 10% of the genome, give or take. We also know that very little of the genome is conserved. So for example, approximately 5% of the genome is conserved across all mammals. That conservation is very strongly indicative of function, but obviously most of the genome with biochemical activity is outside of the conserved region. We know that much of the activity is low frequency, and that is indicative that it is probably spurious rather than having some selected function. So the conclusion is that much of the genome is non-functional, and this is based on ENCODE's data and what ENCODE says about their own data. So to summarize, creationists love to cite the ENCODE project. They claim that uh, ENCODE shows that junk DNA doesn't exist, ENCODE's data and their papers do not show that, uh, and that if junk DNA doesn't exist, evolution is false. And as I showed earlier, that is also not the case. So creationists are 0 for 2 on these measures. Now, if you talk to creationists about this uh, and point out these shortcomings in their argument, they tend to fall back on, and I'm saying this from recent experience, they tend to fall back on, well, yes, we're still learning though. ENCODE's results are preliminary. They're not supposed to be set in stone. We're learning more every day about this stuff. And yes, we are learning more and more all the time about the contents of the human genome. But as we dig in and we do experiments, not just in humans, but also in mice and other organisms, as we dig in, what we find is that a large fraction of the genome is non-functional. We find plenty of junk DNA in the human genome. So has ENCODE disproved junk DNA in the human genome? No, that is a creation myth. Thank you for watching. See you next time. And remember, don't get fooled.